In this lesson, we look at section 4.3. Here, in chapter 4, we are studying functional limits and continuity. In 4.2, we studied functional limits, and today, 4.3, continuous functions. We will see right away that the definition for f being continuous at a point c is very similar to the definition we saw earlier that f has a limit at c. One of the very useful things for us when examining the limit at a point was the sequential criterion for functional limits. We will see something very similar to that with continuity, and that is called the sequential characterization for continuity. Let's recall the limit of a function. What does this mean? The limit as x goes to c of a function f equals l. That means that given any epsilon greater than 0, there is some delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta implies absolute value of x minus l is less than epsilon. c need not be in a. The only thing we required about c was that it was a limit point of a. There was another characterization of this definition, the topological variation, where we talk about neighborhoods. So we could say x being in the delta neighborhood of c, but x not actually equal to c, implies f of x is in the epsilon neighborhood of l. So when those conditions are satisfied, the function f has a limit at c. The limit of that function at c is l. Now, let's turn our attention to continuity. I'm going to change two things. First of all, I'm going to suppose that c really is in my domain. I really can plug c into the function and get a value out. So, I will plug c into my function and replace the l. Now that I know c is a point I can plug into my function, let's talk about what it means to be continuous at c. f is continuous at c if, given any epsilon greater than 0, there is some delta such that absolute value x minus c less than delta implies absolute value f of x minus f of c is less than epsilon. I don't require that absolute x minus c be greater than 0, and I've replaced the l with f of c. Topologically, we can say the function is continuous at c if x being within delta of c implies f of x being within epsilon of f of c. And f is continuous on the entire set a if f is continuous at c for all c in a. All right, let's use that definition. Let f be a function that goes from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, given by the mapping x gets mapped onto the square root of x. We'll use the epsilon delta definition of continuity to prove that f is continuous on the non-negative real numbers. Claim. f is continuous at x equals 0. Let's just look at this one particular point and prove f is continuous at 0. So what do we have to do? Given epsilon greater than 0, we must find some delta greater than 0 such that absolute x minus 0 less than delta implies absolute f of x minus f of 0 is less than epsilon. Cleaning up those expressions algebraically a little bit gives us, we have to show that I can find a delta so that whenever x is less than delta, it has to be the case that the square root of x is less than epsilon. So what should that delta be? My delta should be some expression in terms of epsilon. So what kind of epsilon expression should I have in place of that delta to imply the right-hand side? Well, with a little bit of thought, we see that if x is less than epsilon squared, then the right side of that implication is satisfied. Then square root of x is less than epsilon. Ah, so we should let delta be epsilon squared. Here begins the proof proper. Let epsilon greater than 0 be given. Let delta equal epsilon squared. Then, absolute x minus 0 less than delta, which is recalling what I had earlier, implies that x is less than epsilon squared, which implies square root of x is less than epsilon, which implies absolute f of x minus f of 0 is less than epsilon. So I've achieved 
the right hand side of what I wanted to show. And that's it for this first part of the proof. We have, sh we have shown that f really is continuous at x equals 0. Let's turn our attention to the other x values. Our second claim, f is continuous at x equals c for c any positive number. Given epsilon greater than 0, we must find some delta greater than 0 such that absolute x minus c less than delta implies absolute f of x minus f of c less than epsilon. Once again, cleaning this up a little bit, the right side turns into absolute square root of x minus the square root of c less than epsilon. How can I achieve that? Once again, I want the right hand side expression. Somehow I need to find out how does that relate to the absolute value of x minus c. If I can figure out some kind of a relationship between absolute square root of x minus square root of c and absolute x minus c, then that'll give me a hint on how to define my delta. Absolute value square root of x minus square root of c. Let's do a little bit of algebra. I can multiply this on the top and the bottom times the conjugate, and that equals absolute value of x minus c all over square root of x plus square root of c. I'm, I'm on the right road. There is a problem in that this expression has a variable in it. I would like the only variable in this expression to be in the numerator in my absolute x minus c. So here's a trick. I can get rid of that and end up with an expression that's a little bit bigger. Let's see why that's acceptable. That's acceptable because if now I can show that my new thing is still less than epsilon, then I'll have shown that my original thing, absolute value of square root of x minus square root of c, is still less than epsilon also. If the absolute value of x minus c is less than square root of c times epsilon, basically I've taken my square root of c and I multiply both sides by the square root of c, then my right hand side will be less than epsilon. Consequently, absolute square root of x minus square root of c will be less than epsilon. So I know what my delta should be. Let delta equal the square root of c times epsilon. Okay, let me clean these up a little bit and let's continue on. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Let delta equal the square root of c times epsilon. Then, let's see the implications. I'm starting with the left hand side. Absolute value x minus c less than delta implies, I've just replaced delta with what its value is and I've divided both sides by the square root of c. That implies, based on the star expression up above, that absolute root x minus root c is less than epsilon. Oh, and that is the right hand side of what I wanted to show. So we've done it. Given an epsilon, we have found the delta that makes this implication true. One last question. Uh, why did we have to break this proof into two cases? I will not tell you, but take a look back at the proof and see why we had to do two cases instead of just tackling it all at once. All right, let's continue. Characterizations of continuity. Let f be the function that goes from domain a to the real numbers, and let c be an element of the domain a. My function f is continuous at c if and only if any of the following. I have three statements. One, for each epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero, such that absolute x minus c less than delta implies absolute f of x minus f of c less than epsilon. That is our definition. The second characterization is very similar, it just changes the wording a little bit. For all epsilon neighborhoods of f of c, there is some delta neighborhood of c, such that x being in the delta neighborhood of c implies f of x is in the epsilon neighborhood of f of c. This is the topological version of continuity at a point. The third version is quite a bit different. It's much shorter, and it says, whenever I have a sequence of x values converging to c, where the x values are taken from my domain, it has to be the case that the sequence of function values approaches f of c. x values approaching c implies function values approaching f of c. This is the sequential characterization of continuity. This is a really useful way of approaching continuity.
And remember, this is if and only if. So if I know that my function is continuous, then I know that for all sequences of x values that approach c, it has to be the case that all sequences of those function values approach f of c. But then conversely as well. Sometimes I want to prove that a function is continuous. And if I can prove that all sequences of x values that converge to c correspond to sequences of function values that approach f of c, then the function is continuous. We saw something like this earlier in a previous uh, section 4.2 when we were talking about functional limits. So this statement is very similar to the sequential criterion for functional limits. This third characterization also is a nice simple test to show when a function is not continuous at a point. So I've just repeated the third criterion right there. That's nothing new. That was what was on the previous slide. Here is our criterion for discontinuity. If there exists a sequence of values in my domain where those x values approach c, but where the function values do not approach f of c, then f is not continuous at c. This is essentially the negation of the sequential characterization of continuity. Example, let's look at the floor function. Our book uses the double brackets to indicate the floor function. I have often seen sort of the half bracket kind of the, the round down. This is the round down function, the floor function. So for example, the floor of 3.2 equals 3, but also the floor of 3 just equals 3 also. And you can see the graph to the right. We claim that this function is not continuous at 1. So I will draw your attention to x equals 1. It certainly looks like it is not continuous. Let's prove it. Let x sub n equal n over n plus 1. So this gives us a sequence of values 1 half, 2 thirds, 3 fourths, 4 fifths, on and on and on. And it looks like that sequence of x values approaches 1. Our question is, does the sequence of function values, does that thing approach f of 1? Oh, and what is f of 1? f of 1 is just 1 f of x sub n really is 0 for all of the n for all n in my natural numbers. And so consequently, this sequence of function values is nothing more than a sequence of zeros, which converges to 0. And 0 is not f of 1. So even though my sequence values approach 1, my function values do not approach f of 1. So the function is not continuous at 1. Well, proving continuity by uh, epsilon delta or by the sequential characterization of continuity, it's fun, but uh, there are stronger methods that we have. Here's one of them now, the algebraic continuity theorem. Assume f goes from a to r and g goes from a to r. Assume that these are both continuous at the point c. Then four results follow. A constant times f is also continuous. The sum of continuous functions is continuous at c. The product of functions that are continuous at c is continuous at c. And the quotient of functions that are continuous at c is continuous at c, provided that this denominator isn't actually 0. We will not prove this, but uh, it follows immediately from two facts. The algebraic limit theorem for functional limits from the previous section, and this uh, 432 characterizations of continuity, in particular the part 3, the sequential characterization. There is a great corollary to this algebraic continuity theorem. Polynomial functions are continuous on the real numbers. Let k be a real number and consider the constant function f of x equals k. Also consider the identity function g of x equals x. These really seem like continuous functions, right? I bet you could prove that these are continuous functions. Could you show? that these are continuous on the set of real numbers using an epsilon delta proof. Here is an arbitrary polynomial, actually a polynomial function, p of x. p of x is simply sums and products of the identity function g of x, which is just x, with constant functions like my f of x. By the algebraic continuity theorem then, p of x is continuous. What about rational functions? Here is a rational function, p of x over q of x. A rational function is just a quotient of polynomials. 
Well, once again, we can use the algebraic continuity theorem to give us our result. This rational function is continuous wherever it's defined, so long as q of x isn't actually equal to 0. This function is continuous at every point where it's defined. And in fact, for functions like this, we say that they are continuous on their domain. One last consideration h of x, the square root of 3x squared plus 2, is that function continuous at x equals 5? It seems like it ought to be. But the algebraic continuity theorem is no help to us in this case. It doesn't say anything about square roots. We need something that addresses composition of functions. Oh, here, here we go. Here's a theorem about the composition of continuous functions. Suppose that f is a function from a to b, and g is a function that goes from b to the reals. Then the composition of functions, g of f, that is a function that goes from a to the set of real numbers. If f is continuous at c, and if g is continuous at f of c, then the composition, g of f, is continuous at c. The author of our book leaves that proof as an exercise, which I'm not assigning, but it's interesting to see in the exercise section that they require an epsilon delta proof and they require a proof using the sequential characterization of continuity. Either proof method is perfectly valid when proving facts about continuous functions at a point. And this brings us to the end. All we have left is to look at the homework assignment. There it is. I've included a little hint there for problem number nine. Give these problems a try. Keep reading the book. This is a really good book. I, I enjoy how the author writes. I find it to be very clear. I want to keep encouraging you to uh, go to the book. Uh, and of course, uh, contact me if you have questions. I'm happy to help.